My name is John Vol. I'm now uh, a lurking retiree uh, from Georgetown, and I will be illustrating the dangers that program chairs have when they invite an old geezer to be a panel chair. I'm going to, I'm going to old geezer you a bit. Because as I look around, I suspect I'm the oldest person in the room. Anybody, anybody older than 81? How old are you? Am, am I 81? Okay, we've got one. Good, you can remember more than I can then. I think that the... The old geezer thing that I wanted to do was to look at the panel to introduce the panel from the perspective of having started doing research on politics in the Arab Islamic world 60 years ago. I did my senior thesis in college on the prospects for Arab nationalism. And as I was thinking about this panel, I started, as you should, by looking at the title of the panel. Title of the panel, Trump's Embrace of Political Authoritarianism, Wither the Future of the Arab Islamic World. And the thing that struck me as I was thinking about this was that for 60 years, if you just filled in a blank, that title could have been the title for a panel for any conference. Eisenhower's embrace of political authoritarianism, 60 years ago, looking at the Baghdad Pact and so on. Kennedy's embrace of political authoritarianism, looking at John Baddow and William Polk and advising Kennedy for Nasserite authoritarianism. Nixon with his Gulf monarchies support, Carter with Sadat, and so on and so on. Now as we, as we look at the first part then of that, we've got, this, we've got the title, and then the second thing is, whither the future of the Arab Islamic world? And one of the depressing things for somebody who has been identified as an area expert for now a long time, um, one of the depressing things is that the people who really knew what was going on, if they'd have been on those panels that I just listed, their informed things that they would have said would probably have been pretty wrong. That the idea uh, behind the Baghdad Pact was that there was stability in the established institutions that had traditional legitimacy. The Hashemite monarchies of uh, Jordan and uh, Iraq, and the Shah in Iran, uh, and the relatively emerging non-democratic uh, Democrat party uh, in Turkey and so on. And as, we, as I looked through, as I started thinking about this, and thinking, what would, uh, would, would Bill Polk have been right in his predictions about Nasserism and radical Arab socialism being the, the, f the future of the Arab Islamic world? And he would have been wrong. Kissinger, in the, for Nixon, was wrong. And yet they were informed. And yet they knew what was going on. And so that I mention that as not to predict that all four of our panelists are going to give you predictions in answering to the question of whether the future of the Arab world, I'm not going to promise you that they will give you incorrect or things that won't turn out that way. I do think, however, the one thing that we can be certain of in the future of the Arab Islamic world is that that world is going to be different from what it is now. It's going to be transformed from what it is now. And part of the difficulty that we have as analysts, as citizens, 
as people living in the contemporary world is that our vocabulary, is that our conceptual frameworks, using the more graduate student terminology, our paradigms, you know, are not adequate for understanding the realities of the 21st century. We just heard a panel looking at Tunisia, and it, it would be interesting to be able to do a textual analysis of the text that you were presented. Because much of the vocabulary that is used in that kind of analysis is in flux. And so that, you know, uh, my, my lecture could be, what do we mean when we say authoritarianism? Because authoritarianism meant something very different in the age of Eisenhower. It meant something very different in the age of Carter and of Reagan and so on. But we have, we, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask these kind of questions. It means that we just have to be cautious about our answers and be dramatic, but be willing to be wrong. At any rate, we have a great panel. Uh, you have all of their biographies here. I've promised them that they could talk for 10 minutes and, uh, and, and more. But what will happen is, uh, I'm not telling them to shut up when I stand up. I'm giving them a signal that, in, that they've been talking for 10 minutes, and they have three to four minutes more so that we can then have some time for discussion as well. But let's welcome our panel. Uh, and we will start then, uh, we will, I think, just simply go in the order that is listed in the program. We'll start with Nader, and then Hussein, and then Redwan and then uh, Abdul Magud. So, welcome to the panel. And you will be setting a new precedent by actually accurately telling us what the future is going ah. to be. Well, well thank you, um, uh, John, for being here, and pleasure to be on this panel um, with my co-panelists. That was actually a brilliant and depressing insight that we could, we could be having this conversation 60 years ago or any time since then, and in many ways the conversation would be, I think, rather similar. But mm -hmm. what's, what's so tragic is that 60 years in the future, if things continue, mm. we could still be having this conversation. Exactly. Which is exactly why we're here today, to try and figure a way out of this problem of political authoritarianism. Mm. Um, um, well, as you all know, Donald Trump is on his way to um, Saudi Arabia, um, uh, and he's going to sign uh, a massive uh, new arms deal worth roughly, uh, according to press reports, $350 billion over 10 years. And he's also going to unveil um, a plan for a massive uh, new um, security architecture known as the Arab NATO plan in Riyadh. <coughs> Accompanying him on this trip, is Stephen Miller, one of his senior advisors, who reportedly has written a speech for Donald Trump uh, on Islam that President Trump will deliver before a select audience of uh, 50 Muslim leaders who've been invited to Saudi Arabia to meet the US president. Recall that Stephen Miller, for those of you who don't know who he is, was one of the key architects um, of Trump's Muslim ban um, and he's also a disciple, ideologically, of the notorious right-wing Islamophobe uh, David Horowitz. And at this meeting in Riyadh, an invitation has been extended to the long-standing Sudanese dictator, General Omar Bashir, who has been indicted for war crimes by the International Criminal <coughs> Court in The Hague. Question. Is there anything more you need to know about Donald <laughs> Trump, his foreign policy toward the Islamic world, and his embrace of political authoritarianism than this? All of the key elements that I think really define um, um, what we're dealing with, the problem at hand, is encapsulated in these three news reports that I just sort of stumbled across really over the last 48 hours. And I think 
encapsulated in these new reports, in these new report, news reports on this particular topic, is uh, a reflection of the deep political incoherency and also the complete moral bankruptcy of Donald Trump's approach toward the Islamic world. And I don't see this changing anytime soon. If there's one silver lining, one positive thing I would have to say is that it looks like that Donald Trump might not last for his entire first term. And in that sense, there might be an opening and cause for hope. Um, but of course, Donald Trump can do these things and say these things and pursue these policies because there is a receptive audience in the region um, of unelected authoritarian leaders that you know, embraces this <coughs> fundamental approach to the Middle East, and that's a core part of the problem. So I really don't have you know, a, um, a, a key argument that I want to advance. In many ways, I'm really just left stuttering, trying to you know, interpret and come to terms with what's happening today in Washington with respect to this particular administration. Um, and I just want to share with you some um, you know, scattered thoughts that are relevant to this particular topic. Um, but also try to connect them um, uh, to what's happening today in terms of you know, the, the, the development yesterday that a new special uh, counsel, a ca uh, counselor has been, a lawyer has been uh, you know, um, uh, appointed to look into Donald Trump's relationship with Russia and the broader sort of set of scandals that have been shaping his presidency um, since he uh, assumed office. So one interesting observation that I think is relevant to this topic is the reaction in the Middle East in the region when Donald Trump was elected. Dictators in authoritarian regimes were broadly euphoric. Civil society, pro-democracy forces were in mourning. And this is true right across the region. House of Saud was um, very happy with the election. The other Gulf leaders in the GCC were ecstatic. In Turkey, Erdogan was very happy. And Egypt, of course, General el-Sisi was also quite um, thrilled by the, um, by the election. In fact, if you looked at the mainstream um, pro-Sisi press, they were so thrilled by Trump's election that they were claiming that Trump actually was inspired by the el-Sisi model. That's <laughs> what was really the key story here and what needed to be sort of um, uh, um, you know, discussed is how General el-Sisi here is really leading the way. Um, and I would also include, you know, in terms of sort of regional actors, you know, the, the, the right-wing government in Israel. Um, you know, uh, Netanyahu and, you know, the Israeli settler community were thrilled by, you know, what Trump was saying about the embassy move, the fact that Jared Kushner, who has ties to the Israeli settler movement, was part of the Coastal Foreign Policy team. That was a big sort of, you know, um, general welcoming response. Of course, now that has sort of diminished when, um, um, recently as reality has set in and it looks like the policy that many um, right-wing um, Israelis were hoping for is not going to material Absolutely. materialize and, and come into being. But what's also interesting in the response is that even in the Islamic Republic of Iran, the hardline um, constituency around the supreme mm -hmm. leader expressed cautious optimism mm -hmm. at a potential Trump victory and was quite happy that Hillary had lost. Yeah, of course. And the <laughs> reason for this is not, I think, generally understood, but I think one reason for it is because they saw in Donald Trump and what mm -hmm. he was saying specifically on Syria cause for hope. Yep. Because Iran's position lines up with Putin's on Syria and Trump had a pro-Russian position um, you know, what, what Trump was saying aligned with Putin and the Iranians were hoping, well, this heavy investment that we have put in Syria in terms of sustaining the Assad regime now might be easier to manifest now that Hillary Clinton was out of the picture and the chance of any sort of intervention with greater military force to push back against the Iranian and Russian position wouldn't be forthcoming. Rex Tillerson also gave Iranian hardliners some cause for optimism. He was an oil man. Iran's an oil producing country. They can do business. Um, fundamentally, I think the Iranian regime was happy uh, at the beginning with Trump's victory because, you know, with Hillary out of the way and Trump coming into office, the question of human rights and democracy would not be on the agenda. And that's where the Iranian regime is very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And um, there was sort of, you know, a, a sort of a sense that, yes, you know, this might be a good, a good moment for us. When reality set in and the uh, policy that the Trump administration had toward Iran, articulated by uh, Trump's close foreign policy advisors, became known, and the Iranian uh, regime realized that there was not going to be an opportunity here for them, then the rhetoric of the supreme leader shifted and then he began to use the Trump election as an opportunity to scold 
and to lecture young Iranians and reformist forces in the country by saying, is this the liberal democracy right. that you aspire to? Mm -hmm. Look who they just elected. Mm -hmm. What's so great about liberal <clears throat> democracy? You're making all this noise about human rights and democratic elections. So, you know, the Iranian reaction, again, from the authoritarian regime's perspective, also was at the beginning cautiously optimistic. So that, I think, is the general regional response. Dictators and authoritarian regimes were Celebrating democratic and reformist forces in the region were melancholy and in mourning, and all for very good reason. Because I think in Donald Trump, many of these authoritarian rulers saw someone that they could relate to. In many ways saw a reflection of themselves to a certain Happy degree. that with Hillary out of the way, with the Democrats out of the way, these inconvenient and embarrassing things that they have to at least rhetorically respond to, such as human rights, democracy, a free press, would not be on the agenda and they could focus on common threats and challenges in the region, ISIS, Iran, et cetera, and there would be a fundamental business relationship that would, mm -hmm. that would be the focus. Now, um, there's a lot of discussion that with Donald Trump, his election represents a sea change, a massive transformation, and yes, I think his election domestically for the United States, for democracy, for American values, <coughs> is a fundamental turning point. I think history will record that this election is a fundamental challenge to the type of democracy that we're used to in this country. It does rep represent a threat to um, long-standing American values. But in terms of US foreign policy, I want to argue that despite what many of us have been hearing and uh, seeing in the press and a lot of the commentary, um, not much has changed. Rhetorically, yes, mm -hmm. there's been a change. But what I would argue substantively, in terms of US foreign policy toward the region, we're seeing a lot of the same type of policies, broadly speaking, mm -hmm. that President Obama and other presidents have been pursuing. Yeah. Take the Iran nuclear agreement. Mm -hmm. Just yesterday, Trump was, um, um, had to make a decision whether he wanted to push back or wait, uh, put a waiver on these sanctions that Congress had put in place. He decided to live up to the terms of the Iran nuclear agreement, despite rhetorically saying it's the worst agreement in the history of humanity. Um, it's, it's business as usual. On Israel-Palestine, despite all of the talk that they're going to move the embassy yeah. and they're going to sort of, you know, embrace the, the narrative of the right-wing settler community, that's not on the agenda. Um, and it's pretty much business as usual um, as before, as reality sets in. On Syria, up until April the 4th, up until the, you know, sarin gas attack in Idlib province, the uh, position of the Trump administration was very pro-Russian. Um, there was, I think, a military strike that clearly marks a difference with the Obama administration in terms of the willingness to use force. But now we're back to uh, where we were before. If you look at what the Trump administration has basically been saying on Syria, rhetorically there's more of an emphasis uh, in criticizing um, the Assad regime and Russia. But in terms of the plan that they have, for Syria, it's basically the Obama administration's approach. ISIS first, deal with ISIS, and then with that out of the way, then perhaps we could start to look at the broader underlying conditions. In other words, the question, the fundamental question at the root of the conflict yeah. in Syria, the, the existence of the Assad regime and its mayhem and, mm -hmm. and chaos and its war crimes has basically been pushed down the road for a later time. Um, and then fundamentally we get back to the question of the authoritarian regimes in the region and the Trump position is basically, I would argue, similar to um, what we've uh, seen with the Obama administration, a basically embrace of, um, of, of those authoritarian regimes. Um, um, and you can see that. I mean, the best example is really with General El Sisi. He was in town, uh, I think about a month ago, and there was a lot of talk how President Obama would never allow Sisi into the White House. That is true. But let's not also forget that after the coup in Egypt in 2013, which put an end to the democratization process that was in place, the obama Kerry team basically embraced a narrative where they openly said that what took place in the summer of 2013 in Egypt was a, quote, transition to democracy. And that's a position that they maintained mm -hmm. throughout the next year and a half, at least two years, the last time I checked. There was a slight reduction in aid, but basically it was the embrace of the Sisi regime yeah. with general silence on the, the, the massive roundup of political prisoners, the, the, the orgy of violence that brought Sisi to power. Um, President Erdogan, there was some tension between Obama 
and um, Erdogan, but you know, the same issues that sort of were at the core of the US-Turkish relationship, really over the question of whether the United States should support Syrian Kurds to fight ISIS, that issue is still on the agenda, it hasn't gone away. Um, so I don't see any sizable and, and, and significant shift. And fundamentally, I think at the core of this question is this Faustian bargain that the United States, going back at least 60 years, and I'll end on this point, um, that the United States has struck with authoritarian regimes in the region, falsely and naively believing that these authoritarian regimes, family dictatorships, can be guarantors of stability, is still in place. And that, uh, there's no fundamental change. In fact, there's a greater embracing of those authoritarian regimes, naively hoping that they are going to be um, sources of stability, when in effect, if you're honest about it, they are actually sources of instability and largely responsible for the chaos and mayhem that is um, um, tearing this region apart. And that fundamental relationship fundamentally hasn't changed. So as a last point, I'll just mention that, you know, this is a difficult time for the United States. There's a lot of soul searching taking taking place about um, how Donald Trump got elected. How did we get to this point? How can we get out of it? A lot of healthy discussions about what's wrong with our democracy here, how can we get it right again? I'm hoping in this moment of reflection and reconsideration, we can also in this country have a reflection and a reconsideration about our policy toward the Arab Islamic world. And there is a connection because what you're gonna see very shortly as this special uh, inquiry takes place by Robert Mueller over Trump's relationship with Russia. There, as, there is actually an interesting set of characters related to the Middle East that are gonna come up in this story. General Flynn and his ties to Turkey are a big part of this story. The United Arab Emirates and the role that they played in facilitating a dialogue between the Trump administration and Russia is going to be part of this story. So this is going to come up very soon over the next few months, and it's a moment that hopefully that we can seize upon in this country to really think hard and long about the uh, very troubled relationship that we've had and the very problematic consequences that flow from investing in authoritarian regimes in the region and not the peoples of the region. Thank you.